All right. Welcome, everybody, to our November Sinusure H Quick Patient Family Partnership Hub. Um, we are glad that you are joining us today. This is our, um, our hub vision. The Sinusure H Quick Patient Family Partnership Hub is a pure learning community for patient family partners collaborating with 11 states that make up the Sinusure H Quick. And patient family partners will use their lived experiences to co create improved care for all people in partnership with the Sinusure H Quick hospitals. Just like to read that at the top of the meeting. These are our agreements for the meetings. We practice active and empathetic listening and sharing. We challenge both, we challenge the idea and not the person, uh, be both teachers and learners. We take space and make space. The stories that we tell here, they stay and the lessons leave. We use I statements, one person speaks at a time and we wanna be here and present now. Go. This is our um, check-in question for today. Um, we are getting towards the end of the year, towards the holiday season for, for some of us. Um, so what are you looking forward to the most as we get towards the end of the year? Um, so I can go first. I am looking toward for, oh my gosh, I guess speaking better, <laughs> forward to uh, seeing my family. We've, we live out of state from our family. So we get to go home for Thanksgiving and Christmas this year. And I'm so excited to see everyone and be home. Um, and also being up here in Oregon, we've got, I think, a pretty good winter coming. So um, I'm excited. Hopefully we get some snow to play in. That's what I'm looking forward to at the end of the year. Um, so go ahead and introduce yourself where you're calling in from. Um, I'm going to start here at the top of my list with Linda. Hey, everybody. It's Linda Starnes. I am in storm-weary Orlando. Um, <laughs> it is still storming outside, but I've got internet, so I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> it came back on just a little while ago. Oh um, but, yeah. So I'm looking forward to the fact that hurricane season ends on November 30th, officially. So I'm hoping that the December holidays, we will not be bothered by weather. And the fact that our uh, daughter and son-in-law are traveling to our side of the country for the December, end of the year, uh, Christmas, New Year's holiday, and his birthday, and their anniversary, all in the same week. Oh, how fun. That sounds like a so great we're week. looking forward to having them here. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us in the storm. <laughs> we appreciate it. Um, Barbara. Uh, I'm looking forward to doing nothing. Just, just sitting um, nice. with people I love. Um, you know what? Not even sitting, laying down on the floor. <laughs> and maybe watching um some some old movies that's about it i love that i feel like we all need to do nothing every once in a while thank you barbara um glenn i think i'll uh shake it up with a different answer um Thanks. since we're in healthcare here and we're talking about healthcare. I am looking forward to getting my knees injected in the next three weeks. My insurance doesn't allow me to do it uh, as frequently as I like, but once I get the, my knees injected, they feel great. And um, then I'll be ready for skiing. So that's what I'm looking forward to. Perfect. Keeping with the healthcare theme. <laughs> I love it. Well, I hope your knees feel better yeah. soon. Uh, Laura. Hi, everyone. I'm Laura. I'm calling. I'm talking to you from Paoli, Colorado. Um, I'm doing a healthcare December also, Glenn. Um, I scheduled a mammogram. I scheduled a colonoscopy. I scheduled labs. I did the same for my husband and my kid. And December, we're doing doctor's appointments for a healthy 20. 
I love that. Setting up your new year with all the checkups. Thank you. Um, Mary. Um, hey, everybody. Um, yeah, actually, a little bit of everything that everybody already mentioned. Um, a few things, a few medical appointments at the end of the year to wrap things up, and then um, hopefully some downtime. And for me, um, I get to go to the beach. So looking forward to that. <laughs> Nice, nice. Thank you. Nadine. Oh, and I rushed to get on this call and I made it. Um, made it. Uh, my niece and her family just moved back here after being gone for 15 years living in the Carolinas, north and south. So it's going to be a whole different holiday season. Oh, great. I love when family comes together after a while. Thank you, Nadine. Um, Bev. I am looking forward to actually having Thanksgiving in my home again. Last year, my kitchen was under construction, and the two years before that was COVID. So um, I get to do all that, have oh, the kids' fun. table set up and all that stuff. Oh, so fun. Yeah. My grandma does the kids' tables, and it's when I, after I grew up, we still had kids, and the kids' table got cooler for like the great grandkids <laughs> like lights and it was all decorated and we just had a card table I don't know <laughs> yeah my kids like it a lot too and I'm not sure why but uh, I'm just going with it <laughs> love it thank you Libby hey everybody calling in from Long Beach today um I think the thing I'm most looking forward to is Marco's first Christmas and the whole first holiday season for little Marco, he is, well, not very little, but um, <laughs> anyway, yep, I'm looking forward to having your grandchild around for the holidays. That's so exciting. Thank you. And Lindsay. Hey, everybody. Uh, calling in from Sacramento, California, and um, I'm looking for, I'm going to take it back to Barbara's nothing <laughs> but not nothing just my favorite thing is just sitting with my family or my friends with a blanket a, a warm drink around the fire and just watching old Christmas movies that's that's what I'm ready for and I know you can watch a Christmas movie any time of year but it's most appropriate at this time so I'm looking forward to that <laughs> it just doesn't feel the same yeah it doesn't, you need to be cold with a blanket yeah yeah exactly <laughs> Oh, thank you. Um, did I miss anybody? Let's see. Oh, I think I got you. Oh. All right. Well, thanks for sharing. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, November is uh, Diabetes Awareness Month. Um, and we talked to a few of our patient family partners uh, who live with glycemic control. Um, and they shared their suggestions for ways that hospitals can optimize patient and family engagement to um, achieve the best outcomes. So um, some of the ways that they suggested were a uh, one size fits all approach does not work. Uh, listening to me and really hearing me is the best gift you can give. Uh, understand that I understand my disease and how my body reacts to it. Oh, <laughs> ask me to contribute to my care so you'll know that I understand the recommendations. You are the expert on diabetes. I am the expert on me. Each individual case is a care is a rare disease. And the more we collaborate, the better results we will have. So those are a few of their um, suggestions. And we're curious if any of you have any to add on or um or any new suggestions to add to this list? I'll just say, you know, di diabetes isn't in our family um, or my immediate family, but this list is a wonderful list that is, I think is a global list as well for so many different um, situations and conditions. I, I love everything that they said. Yeah, very true. I agree with you, Linda. I think that's um, very true. What we're seeing in the HQIC is the focus on glycemic control and the number of harms 
that occur because, you know, uh, someone with diabetes, um, our good friend Anthony goes into the hospital for a surgery. He maintains his um, diabetes, manages it at home using a keto diet. And, and then he comes to the hospital and all everything he does gets, you know, kind of whitewashed. So, um, but I agree with you. I think these are pretty good principles, you know, even uh, agnostic of disease, but um, I was surprised myself when I learned how much harm goes on because of uh, glycemic control issues. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, Mary? Yeah, I think um, I would agree. These are great comments. Uh, one thing I wanted to add, uh, especially where I live, um, people probably could use some food support. Um, and I'm wondering, it, you know, from an awareness point of view, if we can make sure that not only our patients and their caregivers aware, but, you know, are the communities aware of just, uh, you know, where the food part comes in and if people are uh, struggling with food just because gas and everything is going up. Uh, you know, I, I, like I said, I was just on a call with a food bank here and out of the 250,000 people that live on this island, you know, they serve service 40,000 people a week, 40,000 families a week. So, you know, I just somewhere in here, I'm just going to throw out that from an awareness point of view, if, the, if we can um, talk about good food availability uh, somehow in, this, in these programs, I, I think that might be, you know, if there's a way we can connect the dots with people to make sure they get the food support they need, that would be great. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think food um, food awareness and accessibility is definitely the route to a lot of things. <laughs> so thank you, Mary. Barbara? Um, <clears throat> Mary, that was so, such an important point. And it, it made me think also about affordability and accessibility um, to the necessary medications once they leave the hospital that should be considered. But what I was gonna say was um, include the family. You know, if, if, if the family member's present, um, include them, uh, speak to them too, ask them if they have questions, ask them for their understanding of the situation, um, ask them for their perspective, you know, on what, the, what, what's, what is in the best interest of the patient. They're, the patient is the expert and the family member is is the, uh, what's the word, like the specialty consultant who knows the, uh, the customer best. I like that, the specialty consultant. <laughs> I like that, that's, yeah, very important. Thank you, Barbara. Anyone else? Lindsay says in the chat, I wonder how we can help hospitals connect the social drivers of health to diabetes awareness. I was thinking the same thing, Lindsay. <laughs> to Mary's point, you know, and that's uh, something we're actually be talking about it more in the next month or so, but something that hospitals will be focusing more on. And I mean, I think it's connected to so many of these other harm topics, including glycemic control that yeah, just somehow making the ties um, with that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mary says families and caregivers are often the glue between patients and care teams, care to impact results. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, everybody. Does anybody else have any thoughts or ideas? I just wanted to go back a quick second to the comment about um, cost and access to medications. Yeah. And um, we heard from one of our H Quick hospitals that they, uh, one of the large H Quick hospitals that ran a um, test program where they. Um, uh, called and verified a person's insurance to be able to get to the medications or to be able to access medications, um, but well before they left the hospital so that they had time to, um, you know, 
modify or do something different if they needed to, rather than sending people out, not, you know, without any access. And I don't know if you guys remember that, but that was one of the main points we came away with in the ready, set, go process was that medications, we had to check for those before people left to know that they could get access to them. And this hospital actually um, demonstrated a positive result in their readmissions from that program. So um, I love the way that you guys are thinking. And I just wanted to kind of, that sparked my memory and I thought, yeah, close the loop on on what we're doing and, and the impact we're having. So um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right. Well, when we do these um, awareness months, we do like to share as many resources as possible. Um, we like for you all to share what resources you have. Um, I do have it up on our forum. I'll add the link in the chat. Um, uh, the ask for resources. Uh, we currently have on there the American Diabetes Association. They have um, a campaign this year that it was about hitting back um, or it hits different is what it was. Yeah, diabetes hits different. So um, that was their campaign. So if you have any other resources that you would like to share, uh, feel free to add it in that um, forum post, or you can always email me with your resources and we can share it out to the hub as well. Does anybody have any resources off the top of their head that they wanna share? Barbara? And keeping in mind the importance of um, the caregiver and the family. And I really like what Mary wrote in, in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, there's an organization called Well Spouse. Um, I think it's called Well Spouse Association or organization. And it's for, it's for the partners of people who are living with um, illness. Hmm. It, it's a, a like a support kind of thing for them. Yep. That's yeah, cool. they have all kinds of resources, educational, um, small small support groups, uh, meetups. Hmm. I like that. I like that's kind of thinking outside of the box of just diabetes awareness resources, but with those suggestions as well. So on that path, maybe some of those food banks and things that Mary was talking about too, might have some resources on food access as well. Linda? Well, in, in line with how we started this whole conversation today, but um, and, and somewhat connected is it's November is always um, Health History Month and, and mm -hmm. connecting with your family at Thanksgiving to make sure, you know, if you don't have health history information, and since diabetes needs is one of those um, conditions that people need to be aware that it's in the, it's in their family, um, because there is a, um, per my understanding, a little bit higher, uh, rate of, um, diabetes within families, um, that that might be another additional thought. I like that. Yeah, that's very important. And I, th I like the idea of gathering your health history <laughs> with your family. Thank you. Any others? All right. Well, I like those um, suggestions and we will take a look into the ones that you suggested and add it to the forum post and send them out in, um, in follow-up as well. So thank you for sharing. And I will go ahead and pass it to Lindsay. Awesome, thank you, Laura. So um, I believe this was last month we had a conversation about, um, you know, just an idea gathering for how hospitals that are trying to develop or sustain patient family partnership programs, what are some of those first steps that we can um, take forward? Um, and this was primarily to support our planning for a sprint 
session, which I'll talk about in just a moment. But um, some of the things that really stood out to us was, you know, keep it simple, start small, um, especially for the rural hospitals, which the Santa Sharp Beach Quick hospitals are primarily um, critical access hospitals and quite rural. Um, so that was one of the things that really helped us in developing our um, sprint and future TA, as well as starting with DEI in mind. Um, that was another point that not only came from the partnership um, hub conversation last month, but also from the state hospital um, partners as well more recently this week. Um, so we just wanted to say thank you for <laughs> Um, all of these um, really incredible ideas, and we'll be sharing some of them throughout the sprint as well when we um, do brainstorming with hospitals. Um, yeah, Nadine. You know, I really got an awful lot of thoughts about this because I've been involved for many years, like many of you have. And in retrospect, I think a great way to get advisors involved and of course the buy-in from the staff that's gonna to have to be their mentor and indoctrinate them is to do something that's a little more laid back for lack of a better phrase. You would think it's something that you'd have uh, a seasoned advisor do, but having done it recently after being on these committees for so many years, I could see that it could really be done early on just to, and the, and the thing is, the task is to just sit in different areas, registration, maybe ER, different areas, and just let these potential advisory members observe things mm -hmm. that they think could be done differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a great activity, Nadine, and we actually had a think tank um, with hospitals yesterday where that, um, you know, we were talking about, you know, what are some of those small steps that um, hospitals can take? Because that's where a lot of the hospitals are struggling right now. They're, they're like, I don't know where to bring in patient and families to help us with our work. And we're like, there is so much. <laughs> and you know, Lindsay, you wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't put such a strain on the staff. They could um, just sit there with a, maybe a buddy, you know, bounce right. ideas up. So you're not having to shadow, the staff isn't having to shadow these people. Yeah. So what these hospitals did, they called them EVS rounding or environmental services rounding. So um, just having the patient family advisors walk the halls um, nice. and look for things like a scratch on <laughs> the yes. wall or a sign that right. doesn't make sense. And that's really that low hanging fruit, um, the, those easy to fix things that, you know, and I think you said it right, Nadine, is it shows the patient, if they can make improvements quickly, it shows the patient family partners are having an impact and it proves to the staff that, hey, this is something that we can do more with. So viable, yeah, right. taking those small steps forward. So um, on the next slide, so we have utilized this um, brainstorm with all of you um, and other discussions with hospitals as well to develop the patient family engagement for equity sprint. And what we're really focusing on is supporting hospitals in meeting metric five of the patient family engagement for equity hospital self-assessment. So that's the assessment that the hospitals do um, twice a year. They'll, <clears throat> excuse me, they'll be doing it again in January. And what we really want to help them do is just move one step forward, take just one step forward on this maturity model that you can see here. So the metric is, does your hospital have an active patient family partnership program or other committees um, where patients and family caregivers are represented and report to the board? Um, so this is how hospitals respond. They, we use this maturity model. So starting, it's not just, yes, we do, or no, we don't. And we've talked a lot about this with all of you before, but a lot of the hospitals that are joining the sprint, which I'll describe in a moment, are at this forming stage. So they have not yet launched a, a program or a committee. Um, and our thought is, you know, we can move them pretty quickly on um, this journey through um, a really kind of rapid pace um, action period where they can develop a plan, start with something small, 
um, identify patients and families to bring into their work um, and really move patient family engagement um, forward at their hospitals. And we wanted to focus here because you know, when it comes to a lot of the other um, patient family engagement for equity metrics, um, you, in order to be performing in any of those, you need to be partnering with patients and family caregivers in one way for another. So that's really why we are focusing here. Um, on the next slide, I have a description of the sprint. Um, and some of you have seen this before, and some of you will be participating in the sprint. We're so grateful um, for your participation and partnership, and we'll be reaching out soon to start prepping for that. Um, but what it is, it's going to be four sessions um, with the HQIC hospitals who um, are registering, um, who want to participate, who want to accelerate their patient and family partnership programs. Um, and really, the whole goal is to support the advancement of their engagement efforts as a strategy to meet their quality improvement activities. Um, they will learn how to engage patient family partners in um, really anything, but we want to make sure that it's relevant for the hospitals. Um, we do want to focus on the SDOH screening, um, so how hospitals are screening for SDOH. That's another just ripe area for patient family engagement. You know, you can create scripts with patients and families on how to screen for that. Um, but they may also choose to focus on sepsis or glycemic control, like we've been talking about, um, or other small projects where they can get those early wins. Um, so hospitals will be joining those four sessions with um, us their peers and patient family partners. And our two main goals are to um, identify three new ways to engage patient family partners in quality work. So we're gonna help them think really broadly. Can they have a listening session, a focus group? Can they do a survey? You know, let's, let's think really broadly about um, how these hospitals might be able to engage patients and families in their work. Um, and then also to engage at least to patient family partners um, in a current project. So hospitals will be going through these sessions. Of course, we'll be doing some level setting and what's going to drive them throughout these sessions is an action plan that they'll create, that small test of change to, um, to identify when and where um, they will and how <laughs> they will engage patients and family caregivers in their work. So, uh, that's all to say, uh, thank you for your input uh, so far. We'll definitely have updates and probably more questions as we move through the sprint um, for all of you, but we're really looking forward to really having a focus with these hospitals throughout the, the next, through January, <laughs> month, two months. <laughs> so any questions? Yeah, Barbara. Not a question, a, a thought um, that it would be really, really interesting to have a parallel track where the hospitals report and track um, what they're learning as they go through each of these steps. Mm -hmm. You know, like what the, 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 the last three questions you have, it'd be interesting to have those questions asked at every mm -hmm. level. Um, and, and to see like what, um, what, what, what is their learning journey map, you know, as, as they go through this. Yeah, that's a great point. I really like that. And something that we can easily incorporate into every session. Um, because, you know, we'll, the, the plan is at this point and Libby and I are still <laughs> developing that plan. <laughs> um, but is to uh, split the hospitals up into two breakout rooms. Um, one will be those who are in the forming and storming phases. So just getting started, haven't done this before. And the other may be in the um, further on phases, maybe even performing, but are struggling with identifying ways to engage their patients and families so they can learn from each other. But I think in those rooms, you know, as they report out on their action planning, we can definitely use these questions to spark conversation and learn about that journey. So that's a great idea. 
We will also be asking um, their confidence level in engaging patients and family caregivers at in, at the beginning of every um, session to see if that progresses as well. Um, which from our experience <laughs> in helping other organizations develop partnership programs, it goes like this. <laughs> Um, I know when I went through the PFCC Partners Gateways program, my confidence level went like this. I was back in 2015. I was like, we're never going to find any patients to partner with. And then I was like, oh my gosh, we have 10 patients that want to partner with us. So um, yeah, that would be interesting to, to hear. Yeah, Nadine? Yeah, I don't quite know how to uh, paraphrase this, but um, my foot in the door to quality really stemmed from attending safety meetings. I was invited to a safety meeting mm -hmm. and it was probably two years later out of my six years on this meeting that's still going strong that I really felt, and I'm not exactly shy, but you know, when I'm out of my realm, I'm not a healthcare professional, you know, I really am a little, uh, uh, I'll say timid. It's not the right word for me, but uh, before I really present something. So it, it's it's a double win because you have uh, the safety, I should imagine every hospital has safety, they have to have safety and quality meetings. And if you just entrench potential patient advisors into a safety meeting, just from an observational standpoint, not even to let them talk and they can find something and then they can research it. It would, it would give them the confidence to present something. There's mm -hmm. hardly a time over the years where I didn't present something and I would have expected them to know about this or, you know, and it's amazing the things you can bring forth as a patient advisor that are pivotal. Yeah. yeah. No, absolutely. And that's where we want to um, help these hospitals out is looking at the work that they're already doing, the committees they already have in place. Um, it's, it's all all ready for patient family engagement. So <laughs> great point, Nadine, thanks. Linda? So I'm kind of gonna be kind of like Nadine, I'm not quite sure how I wanna craft this, but it's just, it, it's such a recent and fresh experience that I'm, I'm just, I'm gonna convey it. It seems like it fits here to some degree, but I'm, I'm a part of a um, leadership institute for the Southeast region of the United States. And I am the only person like me in the cohort of public health and primary care um, leadership folks, and that I'm a family uh, leader. And they've never in the four cohorts, um, including this one, had anybody that was more coming from the the, face, the patient and family perspective in this, this leadership um, institute. And we had a national speaker last week at our first retreat. And this national speaker was wonderful talking about leadership aspects. This person is a leader in the DC uh, current executive branch administration working on a high level uh, initiative regarding social determinants of health for the executive branch, et cetera. But in this person's remarks to all of these leaders from local public health and state level public health uh, entities, as well as um, federal qualified health, um, health institutes, um, this person said, you know, the issue is, is that unless you have the right letters behind your name, huh. you're not gonna be heard. Your, 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 your advocacy, your voice, whatever your leadership aspect, it's not going to be heard. It's not going to be acted upon in the same way. And this is a person, the, I mean, everything this person was saying was fabulous up until that moment. <laughs> and you could cut the tension with the knife in the room of about 30 leaders. And um, so the question arose and there were some questions about that. And this person said, I, re you know, I respect when, I, when people who have boots on the ground are giving information, but it's just, it only goes so far. And she said, because there are, there's such a thing as diploma snobs out there. And that is the reality of our world. Mm -hmm. And so I just throw that out there only because I'm thinking about this wholeness of where you're headed with your sprint and those bias checks on everybody's that yeah. this, on with everyone mm -hmm. that this is 
this is the, I mean, it was just, and this person just came out and said it, I, it's a bias I have to constantly work on, but the reality is, unless you have those letters. Yeah. No, that's helpful for us to keep in mind, Linda. And I remember, I think you shared that on the town hall yesterday and somebody said, you can always put PFA <laughs> um, for your name, which I love. <laughs> I do all the time. <laughs> yeah. I don't have letters. Um, but no, I think it's a good point. And, you know, helping these hospitals bring awareness to the role um, and help them share that with their staff as well. I mean, we also have a readiness tool, which has the implicit bias um, test in it. And we encourage anyone who's getting started with this work to do that as well, to acknowledge them and um, address them. So um, no, it's, it's a point well taken and something for us to keep in mind. Yeah. And I, I just want to kind of recalibrate a smidgen with the PFE sprint. And that is, and because I agree, Linda, that it shouldn't surprise us at this point that those kinds yeah. of comments get made, but they still do. And that's the reality that, you know, we, we continue to work on, but I want to recalibrate us to this PFEE sprint because, We've got about 40 people registered who are really, um, I think the majority, I put the, the breakdown of where our, our H quick hospitals are um, and the majority are in the forming stage. So really just getting started and under the heading of working with the willing, that's what we have the opportunity to do. So I really want to um, come in as those full partners that are, um, celebrating the fact that these guys want to do this work, that they want to engage with their patients and families, and that they are uh, coming to us for technical support and for encouragement and for um, ideas on how they can begin this step. So I just, um, I, I'm so excited that we have that many registrants that kind of, quite frankly, I thought we'd have about half that. So um, I'm, I'm ecstatic that we have this many hospitals who are eager to learn with us about how to effectively engage patient family partners in their programs. And we just started sharing this about a week and a half ago or so. So um, I, I was not expecting this update <laughs> either. Um, but in the registration, we ask what they hope to achieve through participating in the sprint. All of them are just like, we, we have to enhance the work that we're doing. How do we even start? Like they, they want this. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> so I, I want to go around really quickly and say with this sprint and with this work, not just the sprint, but the work going forward, when we reassess in January, what do you think the percentage of people of the 53%, how many, what percentage do you think will move forward into storming? What percent of the 53%? Yeah. I'm bad at math. <laughs> okay, just pick a number. How, how many, what will be the percentage of, of storming? Will it be different? Are you asking me? I'm asking everybody. Okay. Yeah. I think storming will be lower because I think they're all going to jump to norming. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Well, what's the percentage in norming then? A hundred. Mm. <laughs> no, no. 65. Okay. I'm going to say we're going to go into the norming. We're going to move because our goal is to move people, right? I'm going to go in and say we are going to be at 50% in the norming phase when we reassess in January. And I realize we're recording. <laughs> Anybody else higher, lower? On record? Um, yeah. <laughs> this is Mary. I, I think you're going to be close, uh, but I think that just because it's sort of the end of the year thing, you might run into a bit mm -hmm. of a glitch just because there's you know but i i think that i heard that question of there's going to be some folks that they're going to want to they might jump into norming but um they're they're going to try something and I, it's it's, it's going to be interesting but like i said i think the only watch out i would throw out there is that it is the end of the year 
and uh, sometimes it that um, you're gonna you might run into a little bit of a lag. Thanks for keeping us grounded, Mary. <laughs> All right, I've got 10 bucks from Linda. Victoria has her hand up. Yes, you know, I was going to say, I, I would suspect that half of the people would take a jump um, in January. You know, we tend to be optimistic, but I do think Christmas plays a part in it. Um, certainly honest self-evaluation plays a part in it. Um, but I would be curious going from January to March, you know, sustaining that because that's where, you know, every time I see this come up and I look at it and I evaluate myself, I'm not even, you know, I go like this. That's I love Lindsay seeing your hands do that yeah. because, uh, you know, sometimes I feel really good about it, like made this great stride and other times I, you know, kind of think, oh my gosh, <laughs> So I'm going to say 50% will jump into the next step and hopefully it'll be sustainable. That's a great point, Victoria. And I think will help us. I mean, it's, it's good to think about how we can help the hospitals sustain mm -hmm. as well. Um, what, what other TA can we, you know, can we continue to bring them together in one way or another? So, and the great, great news is that we have two more years. So it's not like we're going to do this and then leave them and hope they sustain it. Hope is not a plan. So we will plan how we will help them to sustain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Barbara. Uh, Libby, I have a question for you. Um, given, given what you were saying when you were kind of helping us reset um, our thinking, um, are, are there specific, specific messages that that we should hold on to and offer if we're involved in these sprints um, so that there's consistency um, and and they're hearing similar things um, in different in different breakouts are, are there key messages that you want us to know and 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 share that's a great question that i'm going to give do thoughtful process before I answer. So um, I think I'm going, we are going to do prep with those of you who would like to join the sprints. And <clears throat> we will have a sprint session, but I will add that so that uh, I really like that idea of some consistent sort of messages. Um, you know, we, as part of our work with the Sunshare H Quick, we have um, the gateways that Lindsay mentioned as, as our roadmap to developing patient family partnership councils or, or programs. Um, and so it'll be heavily rooted in that, but not entirely because we've also evolved our thinking around inclusion and diversity. So um, I will take that back and give you a thoughtful response. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great question. Yeah, it was a great question. Always making me think, keeping on my, on my toes, Barbara. <laughs> All right, Nadine, and then I think uh, we have one more discussion lined up. So I want to save some time for that. Go ahead, Nadine. I'll just real quick. Well, number one, I always hate to follow Barbara because, you know, she's in a class of her own. But, um, you know, you can be in these meetings. It could all be well intended. I'm thrilled that the number is 40 plus. I'm so encouraged by that. These are hospitals. These aren't even people. And, um, but you got to get a, you got to get a quick win from somebody, no pressure or anything, but you can sit in a group and okay, Nadine's our new patient advisory advisor and, you know, um, and, uh, but to get the group to embrace you is, it's almost insurmountable. I don't care how much you want to be successful. Uh, you can have two or three people just totally get it. And the rest of them are just like, who's she, you know? It's that bias thing a little too, I gotta be honest. But if you have them meet to really get a jump start, meet with the patient experience officers or whatever they're called, just expose them to a little bit of what's going on behind the scenes, mm -hmm. give them the confidence and uh, take it to heart that they are hearing things that are you know, really confidential. I think you'll get that rapport quicker than if you just let somebody sit in the back of a room. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so are you, Nadine, I just need to get clear. Are you referencing the, that's what the advisors need or the staff? 
I, I think for the staff that's responsible for mentoring a new advisor or an advisory mm -hmm. group, they have to have advisors possibly work with patient experience department so they can get exposed quickly to some of the roadblocks in the hospital, some of the things that patients are concerned about, just mm -hmm. like an overarching view. So they might have some great idea that can cure some of the problems in the hospital, especially if they're prevalent. Mm -hmm. And then and then when you entrench a patient advisory member into a project or something, you take them to that next step, they'll already have the recognition, they'll already have something under their belt to give them the confidence and to give the people that are trying so hard to be successful with this and not stall out, you know, some, uh, some win to show the, the need for it. Gotcha. Thank you. Mary? Um, yeah. I, one of the things that I've observed over the years, especially with groups that I joined that, that are, you know, that I'm new to their team, it's storytelling comes into play quite a bit. And a lot of times, you know, we'll go in and we'll be armed and dangerous with, you know, with the, with the story about the why that, you know, of why patients and families need to be considered. Um, but it just came to my mind that maybe a champion could come in that has some of that street cred and has the alphabet soup after their name or is, you know, a somebody at the top that could come in and tell a story of how a patient family advisor made a difference. And maybe it's not at that hospital, but maybe it's at another hospital. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just throwing that out there because I think there's so many times I've been, you know, in, you know, I joined teams and it's easier to see when you're face to face, but you still get it on Zoom where you, you can just tell that people are looking in, they're just looking at you like, why are you here? Uh -huh. And so um, just confront that, I think, up front and get a why from somebody, you know, pretty high up the food chain or somebody who's got some street cred or somebody who can tell a story where, you know, patient family advisor made a difference. And I think that links up with the Office of Patient and Family Experience or whatever. They may be able to pull somebody in that can tell that story. Um, it would be nice if you could get one from the patient family advisor and someone, you know, kind of both sides of the team perspective, but that's just a thought on how to, you know, get some credibility from the beginning. Yeah, that's a great thought, Mary, and actually something that came up. So we also did a series of storming sessions, which I think I talked with this group about also with hospitals to hear their challenges and um, their ideas, what's worked well for them. And um, when the challenge of getting staff engagement came up. Um, the idea to go along with that was to gather some success stories from people who have done patient family engagement really well and have had early wins and big successes to be able to share those as best practices because it's hard to when you're a, a staff member who's new to patient family engagement and you don't know <laughs> where to start or what to do. So some of those best practices um, I think are, are a great idea and might be well, we're going to have a ton of new examples after this sprint. So, <laughs> um, but we already have so many great ones as well. Uh, so sh I think sharing those would definitely help some folks. Oh, great. Well, th thank you. This was more than I expected. I really appreciate the conversation and the questions and just helping us um, think through this as well. So we'll definitely report out um, in December. I can't believe it's November. <laughs> well, thank you, Lindsay. Thanks for sharing and everybody. Um, all right, we'll go ahead and move on. And with the last uh, eight minutes or so, we are curious where you all have partnered in the past. We would like to compile a list of all the places um, that you have partnered in healthcare in the past um, to kind of connect you all and um, and just out of curiosity. <laughs> so, so this is, let me give a little bit more context if I could. Um, this actually came from Glenn. Glenn had an idea when we were thinking about how to help hospitals um, engage patients and families in not only patient family advisory councils, but in other directions as well. And what does that look like? 
Um, and Glenn had this great idea of why don't we ask everybody and, and develop a big list. So um, as is my usual, I took a small idea and made it larger. And so what we'd like to do, um, we have been asking PFA network members, but we'd also really like to ask this group, you know, very specifically, where have you partnered? Whether it's a hospital patient family partnership council, whether it's a um, a work team um, within a hospital or a health system, um, you're you're all partnering with Sinusure H Quick either through the hub and uh, the partnership council. So, what are those specifics so that we can develop this big long list for hospitals to say, oh, I could I could do that one, I could do that one. That's the 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 context for the ask. Is that helpful? Yes. So you can start belting them out because we're recording or you can throw them in the chat. I know that all of you have several and I'd love to hear it. Yes, Barbara. Um, do, do you also want like, I'm involved in, in Sutter, which is big. Mm -hmm. So I have lots of different touch points. All those, all those touch points are jewels, Barbara. If you can imagine another health system going you know, looking at the list of, you know, um, being involved in medical education. What? Medical education? I never thought of that before. So yeah, all those specific touch points. So so not just saying the name of the organization, but the, the specific um, point of contact within the organization. Okay. I, I think that the specific activity you're involved in is, is probably more... Um, more relevant for this group than uh, the organization itself. Okay. Glenn, did I blow up your idea sufficiently or? <laughs> it's just the word partnered that messes me up. Yeah. Because yeah. we all work on projects within our own healthcare system. So when you talk about partnering, I'm not really sure what you mean. I can talk about projects that we've worked at, at, you know, the hospital that I'm involved with. And I can talk about but you know, partnering with who? I mean, I don't, that's the part that throws me off. You guys use that term a lot. It was actually on the last slide, and it, it makes it makes it seem like you have to, you know, we let's you know we did a storytelling program that was you know we just talked about. Who did we partner with? Well, we partnered with I don't know the people in that worked in the hospital there. I don't, that's the, that's what the, what I struggle with is the term partner. I can talk about projects, but partnering is like very specific. Like you want me to say like, okay, we talk to the nurses and we talk to the social workers. Is that what partnering means? I think we want to get to the projects that, that people have done. That's really great insight. I know that I've been struggling with how, how we use the term partnering and partnership um, I, I totally understand what you're saying. Um, so thank you. I appreciate that. Does that resonate with others or do, do others have ideas about how we could ask this with more clarity in order for people to respond? Well, so I'm going to differ a little bit because that term gets used a lot in the world that I'm a part of and partnering in patient care. We want, we're, we're wanting physicians to be partners at the individual level with, um, with their patients and caregivers. Um, so par partnering patient care does resonate with me when, when you're looking at it at that aspect. But, you know, mm -hmm. I, I see, so I, I'm a part of, I'm on an advisory team for a very large PCORI funded research study. Mm -hmm. And so that's involvement, not in the hospital seven, setting, but with 14 different clinical teams across seven states. So if you're wanting to show the different ways that people engage, it, I mean, that'll be my laundry list that I'll send you. I, even, I mean, I sit on the board of directors for our Disability Rights Florida office, which is not within the healthcare system, but they have a ton of healthcare related um uh, issues that come to them for people to have their rights met in the in the healthcare setting. So that that I don't know that that's going to be helpful, Libby, and what y'all are looking for. But I I will send my list of engagement in that way. Fantastic, thank you, Glenn. 
If I'm forming or storming, I want to hear what projects people have worked on on their PFAC. I don't want to know who they partnered with. I mean, that's part of the answer, but I want to know what they did. Because I think if they're struggling to get things going, like what did they actually do so that they can say, aha, I can do that too. That's what I would want to hear if I was, you know, trying to, if I was forming and storming mm -hmm. or norming. Mm -hmm. I, I think that that specificity is kind of what we're hoping for. Um, mm -hmm. I think that both are very helpful. Um, so even the larger regional projects and things like that, it just is going to, going to expand the thinking of where where folks can go. So maybe we only share the hospital based um, responses that we get with this audience, but maybe for another audience, we share the other. Um, or maybe we just create a giant list and let people figure it out, you know, figure out the, the pieces they're looking for. I'm not sure what it looks like until we get the responses. So you're bringing up some really important questions to um, how do we then use the responses in an effective manner? So maybe it'd be helpful if Laura could put one of those uh, things where we put the post-its on and we could all just add to that. Or we could sure. all email. I mean, either way, I don't care. Either way, what's we can do both. You guys can choose to use a Jamboard, or you can choose to send it to us. How about that? <laughs> I'm an and thinker. I love I'll, the Jamboard idea. I can send out a Jamboard in follow up, and you can either use that or email it to me. Whatever's easier for you. So, um, Laura, to get to your question in the, in the chat. Um, yeah, I think that's kind of what we're looking for, just to, again, help these tiny hospitals say, <laughs> okay, we can do that one. We can do that one. Or, yeah, perfect. Um, so sounds like Laura will create a Jamboard and then um, anyone who would prefer to use email, please feel free to send it. I mean, I'm just going to complicate it a little bit more, but I think- That's it, so it awesome. Be, <laughs> it would be great, like you can put, like a project name, what the project was, who you partnered with, like, like, I don't know, like an Excel spreadsheet, those are three columns. I don't know, maybe add four, you know, other columns that people think would be important. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I was kind of thinking about that, Glenn, too, because it's the process mm -hmm. as well for how that project came together. Uh, and it also could be like a project. We did this in the forming stage. We did this in the norming stage. We did this in the storming stage. We did this. See, that would be like really valuable to people like that are going to be participating in these 40 hospitals. Yeah. We um and we heard that from our hospitals too, to say, you know, you're giving us so many great resources. That's awesome. But like, can you break it down for us? Which one should we start with? And um, so that's a that falls right in line. That's Justin. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Bev, for adding yours there in the chat. We'll grab that. Um, we are just one minute past. So um, again, we'll send this out in follow up. And I know you all have a big list <laughs> to send. So um, definitely we'll capture all of those. Our next meeting is December 8th at uh, the same time, 12.30 p.m. Pacific, 3.30 Eastern. If you have any questions or comments, my email is uh, right there on the screen. I also added it into the chat. Feel free to email me and um, we'll get your questions answered. We'll see you all in our next meeting and on the forums. Thank Great you. to see you guys. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Happy Thanksgiving. You too. Thanksgiving. You too. Stay safe over there. <laughs>